Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of Heather Campion, CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming to this special forum, which is co-sponsored with the Boston Globe and supported by our generous underwriters, lead sponsor Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, and the Boston Foundation. I thought by way of introduction, I might read a few brief portions of David Greenway's engaging new memoir, Foreign Correspondent, and explain how they connect, in my mind, with two men we honor in this library, John F. Kennedy and Ernest Hemingway. In the book's introduction, Mr. Greenway writes, if there's a thread that connects the following episodes of my reporting life, it is the great process of decolonization, the single most important historical phenomenon of the last half of the 20th century. The turmoil that it brought is with us still, and the issues it created remain unresolved. Overshadowed by the Cold War and the minds and memories of Americans, decolonization affected far more people around the world than our struggle with communism. It was my fate to witness the last days of empires in some corners of the world and to follow the sometimes tragic efforts of the United States to fill the vacuum of retreating empires. Mr. Greenway's observations reminded me of a prescient speech that then Senator John F. Kennedy delivered in 1957 on the question of the war in Algeria. It was one of the speeches that prompted pundits and world leaders alike to take notice of this rising political star. The most powerful single force in the world today, JFK stated, is neither communism nor capitalism, neither the H-bomb nor the guided missile. It is man's eternal desire to be free and independent. The great enemy of that tremendous force of freedom is called, for want of a more precise term, imperialism. And today that means Soviet imperialism, and whether we like it or not, and though they are not to be equated, Western imperialism. Thus, the single most important test of American foreign policy, Kennedy continued, is how we meet the challenge of imperialism, what we do to further man's desire to be free. On this test, more than any other, this nation shall be critically judged by the uncommitted millions in Asia and Africa and anxiously watched by the still hopeful lovers of freedom behind the Iron Curtain. If we fail to meet the challenge of either Soviet or Western imperialism, then no amount of foreign aid no aggrandizement of armaments, no new pacts or doctrines or high-level conferences can prevent further setbacks to our course and to our security. Now on to Ernest Hemingway, who was himself a foreign correspondent writing for the Toronto Star in the aftermath of World War I, including, famously, dispatches about refugees who were displaced and dispossessed by the Greco-Turkish War. His war reporting forged a new style of writing heightening the emotional impact of an experience by communicating small details intimately preserved. Allow me to read an excerpt of a story that's in the new memoir titled Pakistan's Agony, written by Mr. Greenway in July of 1971 and worthy of Hemingway himself. Across rivers, down roads, and along countless tracks, the population of East Pakistan continues to hemorrhage into India. At most border crossings, there are no checkpoints, no defined frontiers, just mud tracks leading out of Pakistan like pores in the skin. At one such crossing, we watch them come, an endless unorganized column with a few pathetic kettles, boxes, bits of cloth on their heads, carrying their sick children and their old, their bare feet padding on the track with the mud sucking at their heels. They were silent for the most part, except for children whimpering, and their faces were blank. Along the track, the column never ended, night and day pushing into India. They bring cholera with them, and when they die by the road, no one buries them. At Boira, there's a landing where high palm trees bend gracefully over the river. Women wash and children splash in the water, and a few feet from them, where the ducks are swimming, there is a body of a child bobbing, swollen among the water weeds. It has been there since yesterday. Should I wade in and lift it out of the river? But what would I do then? What can anybody do? Throughout his legendary career, David Greenway served as foreign correspondent for the Washington Post and Time Magazine, capturing the facts as he saw them and their geopolitical impact, but conveying them in a manner that engaged the conscience of his readers. Eventually, the Boston Globe lured him back to his home city, where he served as the Glo Globe's foreign editor and then contributing columnist, where many of us relied on him for years to explain both the history and the implications of the international crises of our times, 
and what should be done about them. Today, I know many of you join with me in gaining similar wisdom from the columns of Nick Burns, this afternoon's moderator, whose insights on American foreign policy are informed by his 27-year-long career in the United States Foreign Service, where he served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, U.S. Ambassador to NATO and to Greece, and the State Department's spokesman. He's currently a professor of diplomacy at the Harvard Kennedy School. David Greenway's memoir, memoir which is on sale in our bookstore, also provides a glimpse of the personal cost borne by those who bring us vital reporting from overseas. He writes of moments when he pulled him, put himself in harm's way and saved the lives of others, on the gruesome sights he witnessed and the memories that can never be shaken, and of moving his family through various continents and needing to live apart from them for long spells in order to report from the front lines. I especially appreciated an anecdote he recounts of a moment when his family was living in the Middle East and his stepmother called on the phone. His daughter Sadie answered, and when asked if her parents were home, Sadie replied, Pops is in Cairo and Mums is in the bath. <laughs> well, we're so pleased that Mr. Greenway is here with us today, providing us an opportunity to express our appreciation for a lifetime of thoughtful reporting and commentary culminating in this wonderful new memoir. Please join me in welcoming Nick Burns and David Greenway to the Kennedy Library. Tom, thank you very much. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be back at the Kennedy Library. Uh, this is Pearl Harbor Day. You might have seen as you drove in, the flag is at half-mast. That's a federal order from President Obama. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, of course, was a young naval officer in the years that followed Pearl Harbor. Uh, David Greenway was a young naval officer sometime later after his graduation from Yale. I thought we should start to thank those two naval officers, but also the men and women of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so we're going to have fun today. David has written a compelling new book. And if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll all see it in the bookstore and maybe even consider buying it afterward. I'm his advance agent. Called Foreign Correspondent. It chronicles this extraordinary life that he and JB, who's here with us, lived 50 years, 96 countries, as Tom said, Time Magazine, first a stringer, then reporter, Washington Post corresp war correspondent, um, editor of the Boston Globe, still writing, still traveling, still going to tough places. He was just a couple of years back in Afghanistan. And David, when I read your book, it seemed like you were everywhere at every central event from the late 50s to 2010-11. You were the Forrest Gump of journalists <laughs> in a lot of ways. And I thought, David and I actually rehearsed this this morning a little bit on the phone, but I thought I might just recount for you so that we can get to the crucible issues in the book, here's where he was. As a young Yale student, he was in, Su he was in, in Egypt just before the Suez War of 1956. At Oxford, he met Henry Luce, became a stringer for Time magazine. You met John Fitzgerald Kennedy when he was president at a garden yes, party. In Washington. In Washington. Yes. Uh, you were at the White House in the hours following President Kennedy's assassination. You were outside St. Matthew's Cathedral uh, for his funeral mass. You recount, because you've rediscovered your re repertorial notebooks, when you stood on August 28, 1963, just before mm -hmm. the events of November, you saw this young preacher take the podium with several hundred thousand people before him. And you recounted, he said, I have a dream mm. nine times during that speech. You're in Vietnam, you were in Saigon, you were embedded with our troops, you saw the war turn from opportunity to defeat. You were in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Hong Kong, you covered the Bangladesh War, you covered Sadat's visit to Jerusalem in 1977, you covered the Lebanon Civil War, you saw the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of communism in Eastern Europe, the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, and you've been to Afghanistan quite recently to look at that war. I found your book elegantly written. I found it beautifully evocative in time and place of Southeast Asia in particular. Mm 
even your description as a, as a very young kid of what World War II was like in Wellesley mm -hmm. and Needham, Massachusetts. But most of all, and this gets to what we really want to talk about, I read some warnings in your book uh, to us today for Americans to beware, as John Quincy Adams told us to beware, that when we set out to seek monsters to destroy, which was John Quincy Adams' famous description, warning to us, we sometimes get into big trouble overseas. And a lot of the book, I think, is about that. And I wanted to start there. Yeah. Slaying dragons. Slaying dragons. Yeah. Welcome. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, should we start with Vietnam and the... Um... Let's do this. Before we get there, mm -hmm. before you get mm -hmm. to Saigon, why journalism? What was it about your youth, your upbringing? You had very interesting parents who, were, who had traveled widely. Why, why that profession? Well, I think Harrison Salisbury, the great New York Times correspondent, said being a journalist gives shy people a chance to ask questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You and, don't seem to be shy to me. Well, it, I sort of drifted into it. I, I originally thought I was going to be in your former position. I thought the State Department or AID, mm -hmm. and because colonialism was just ending and there'd be wonderful opportunities to Americans to do good things in these former colonies. But I got to Oxford and I was made the stringer. and. Um, I had so much fun uh, going around and, and uh, questioning people. Um, Luce, uh, Henry Luce wrote this. Can I borrow this for Please. a second? Please, um, it's your book. Th there's, a, <laughs> there's a thing in here where Luce says, I think it's 284 maybe, um, he wrote this uh, perspective for Life magazine which came out in 1936. And um, he, uh, it, was, it was a due uh, publication. Um, and he was trying to get people interested in advertising in it. And he wrote that the purpose of Life magazine, and we forget now how important Life magazine was in the 50s and 60s, uh, before television. Uh, time Life had a grip on the American public that it, it doesn't have anymore. But he wrote that the purpose of this magazine was to see life, to see the world, to eyewitness great events, to watch the faces of the poor and the gestures of the proud, to see strange things, machines, armies, multitudes, shadows in the jungles and on the moon to see things thousands of miles away and things hidden behind walls and within rooms, things dangerous to come to. Now, wouldn't you want to go into that yes. business? <laughs> <laughs> well done. So you're at Yale, you're studying history, yeah. you're studying government, and that inspires you to go out and see the world. Well, I was an English major, but I decided to go to Oxford because I thought I should have majored in history. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, had you written much as a kid? Well, you know, the usual stuff. No, I, uh, I wouldn't say I was uh, prodigious in any way. <laughs> so when you met the great figure, yeah. the greatest figure in journalism of his day was Henry Luce. You met, tell the story of how you met him. It's a wonderful story. Well, he'd seen an article he, that I had contributed to about the price of wolf's urine. Uh, <laughs> it turned out that the Oxford hunt, the, uh, riding to hounds, used a uh, drag hunt. They would put wolf's urine in a sack and drag it around, and then the horses and dogs would follow that. And it needed to be more powerful than the f smell of a real fox. So when the London Zoo was going to put up the price of wolf's urine by a shilling on the imperial gallon, uh, that was the end. I mean, the Oxford, this is the end of Western civilization. Uh, <laughs> and, and you so wrote about it. Luce liked that story. So he, he summoned me down to London, and I was ushered into the presence in this very impressive building, the Time Life Building, and London was the first building built after the war, and it was very grand. And um, finally he interviewed me in this gruff way, and, 
I, I think, I, yes, sir, no, sir. And, and he said, well, how did you get here? And I said, well, I, 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 I came on the train. And he said, well, um, first class or second class? And I said, oh, second class, sir. He said, never do that again. Time magazine travels first class. <laughs> and that was about the end of it. Uh, Time magazine ended first class travel very soon. And now uh, ex the great age of expense accounts, I'm sorry to say, is gone. So you started writing for Henry Luce. You're an Oxford student. Yeah. What got you to Vietnam? Well, I, I, um, I thought this was going to be the story of my generation. And then I'd better better go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, th things to see and dangerous to come to, you know, and that's, that's I, I better be there. And so you went first for Time Magazine? Yes. Yeah. And then you um, became a Washington Post course. Yes, I switched to the Washington Post. And you essentially covered the war from 1967 to its very end in 1970. Well, in and out. With, uh, with starts and stops. Yeah, it was starts and stops. Yeah. I would, I was in Bangkok for a while covering Cambodia and Laos, mm -hmm. and and uh, but yes, I arrived in '67 and I left from the American embassy in April 30th, '75, April 29th. When you arrived in 1967, did you think that the war was just? Yes, I thought we needed to make a stand against communism, and this was the right thing to do, and. Uh, uh, but as I, as the time went on, I began to see that this really wasn't a war about communism. This was a war about nationalism. And this was a war about uh, how uh, the Vietnamese people, having thrown off the French empire, was now having to deal with us trying to impose our will on them. And... Um, I saw that our side wasn't as motivated as the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, I began to wonder why. And I think, first of all, corruption was a terrific uh, burden around the South Vietnamese government and army. And it sapped the will of the army. These uh, generals would, you know, the, the money was pouring out to banks in Bangkok and everyone could see it was a corrupt society right up to the nose. And also that our side seemed to be the tool of foreigners, we being the foreigners, and uh, that our Vietnamese couldn't inspire people the way the other side could as the nationalist side, as we're the true uh, heroes of, of, of Vietnam, of pushing back foreigners. Um, and then I began to see that while we were obsessed by the Cold War, and that's why we got into Vietnam, to stop uh, uh, communist aggression, that the Vietnamese didn't really, it wasn't really about communism. It was about colonialism and the end of European empires. So that's why I began to see that the big story we were missing was that this was really a colonial uh, war. We, we, had, we came there thinking we would be better than the French. We would do it differently. But we ended up doing it much the same. And Tom, I think, read out the sentence in his introduction. And as a very evocative yeah. sentence, you say, the single most important phenomenon of the last half of the 20th century is decolonization. And we forget about decolonization, the huge impact it had on global politics yeah. in the 50s and yeah. 60s. So you came to see it in that way yes. through your experience. Well, I'd been more American and Eurocentric. <clears throat> you know, I'd been living in Europe. And of course, the Cold War was European and American was against Russian aggression, which if the Russian army would attack Western Europe. But when I got to Asia, I began to look at it through an entirely different lens, that the anti-colonial struggle was much more important outside of Europe and the United States than the Cold War. And even China, the communist country, so much of, of Mao's struggle got support because he was, in effect, uh, fighting against the unequal treaties that had diminished China. So with, in, the Westerners had taken advantage of China for 100 years. And he was rebelling against that, and he was able to pay 
Chiang Kai-shek as the tool of foreigners. So I thought the line that jumped out at me in reading your book about this period, Vietnam, mm -hmm. is you write, the central story of our time is America stepping into other people's empires, mm. which we essentially did in mm. following the French. Yeah. You're based in Saigon. You're living in Saigon, but you're going out repeatedly with US Marines mm. into the countryside, into battle with them. You are armed for that battle helmet, mm. right? Tell yes. us about that. Well, uh, it was much like it is today. The, we didn't call it embedded then, but you went along with the troops and you spent several days with them and you got to know them and usually they wanted to tell their stories. And um, if they were under fire, you were under fire and, and um, you know, that's just what you did. But there was much more freedom in that war than reporters have now we were allowed to jump on any helicopter and go into the battle and stay as long as we liked. And then as long as there was room on the helicopter, we could come out and file our stories and go back in. So we had mobility that I never found any of my colleagues in, uh, in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan had. And of course you weren't armed. No, no, except for once. Uh, you, except for once. Is that well, an interesting the, story to relate? Well, <laughs> we, it was a, journalists didn't carry weapons. And the thought was, you're a non-combatant and you shouldn't be involved in the battle. And uh, in, uh, everyone could say bao chi in Vietnamese, which means journalist. I mean, if you were captured, you weren't, you weren't uh, a combatant. But there was a time in a, during the uh, battle in Hue, and the only way they could take the wounded out uh, was from river boats, uh, sort of landing barges on the river. And um, they would bring the wounded and put them in the boat, and then it would go out the Perfume River and then down to Da Nang. And the um, North Vietnamese were shooting at the boat from the banks. And the uh, Navy chief who was running the uh, landing bar said, everybody who can fire a weapon, just I'll tell you port, then starboard, then port. And I want every man on this boat to, to just put suppression in fire, just fire on the riverbank and to keep their heads down and so we can get away. And I had seen a boat behind us get hit with a rocket propelled grenade and blow up and sink. So it seemed like a good idea to do what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so you became, for that moment, for that a combatant. Moment, yeah. I'm not, I'm not proud of that. And Gene Roberts, who was the New York Times man, later became managing editor of the Times, refused to do so. And years later, we had uh, dinner in New York. And I said, you know, Gene, all these years, I think you were right, and I was wrong. And he said, that's funny you say that, because I've often thought you were right and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, you ended up with the U.S. Marines uh, in the Tet Offensive, yeah. and you ended up being wounded. That's true. And you had to undergo an operation in a field hospital. Can you tell yes. us about that? Well, I, I, um, I was, it was urban fighting, uh, uh, and the Marines hadn't seen fighting inside a town, the old capital of Hue. And um, in fact, they never saw that again until Fallujah in Iraq. And um, so it was house to house fighting and very close to where the enemy was. And I was uh, getting as low to the ground as I could and scribbling notes. And uh, the Marine uh, was shot through the throat. And the Navy corpsman who was trying to rescue him was too small to lift him. It wasn't strong enough man. So I said, well, all right, I'll take the legs and you take the head. And we tried to carry him out and then some other people came and helped us. And as we were coming out, a rocket propelled grenade came and knocked us all down. And you were wounded? Yeah. The, the soldier he died later. He didn't make it. He didn't make it, no. Uh, 
you ended up being operated on. Yes. And you had North Vietnamese wounded. No, South Vietnamese. South Vietnamese, excuse me, yeah. wounded, and you in the same. Well, that hospital. that's uh, I I they they put the lightly wounded out in the rain, and I had to wait 45 minutes or so in the rain before it was my turn to get operated on because there were so many people hurt. But the South Vietnamese, they had in, the doctors had instructions to take Americans first. And my surgeon was livid with rage. He said we should take the most serious wounded, no matter who they are, not Americans first. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified he was going to take his rage out on me. And, <laughs> you know, the, or the, the wrong leg would be taken off. Or, you know. But it, he d did his job. But uh, I could see what he means. I mean, it, it, here are our allies. And why would they have to lie out in the rain? Sure, lo quite right. Where I got taken in. Um, you still carry some of that shrapnel? Yes, but it doesn't bother me. It, it, it used to set off uh, uh, detectors at airports, but that has been removed, so there's just some. But I have to look out for those magnetic, what do they call it, MRIs? MRIs. I, I have to be yeah. careful with MRIs. <laughs> so um, we were talking before at lunch here about the, the high number of journalists who were killed or wounded yeah. in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a fact of life. Oh, sure, yeah, but it when is you now. This, yeah. It is now, but it was then. Yeah. It's much more dangerous for journalists now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then, well, if you were caught by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, uh, they didn't care about anything. They'd just kill you. Uh, there wasn't any video of your death or anything. They just killed you. Um, but if you were caught by the North Vietnamese, or the Viet Cong, you had a good chance of, of getting out of it. And, um, but this has completely changed now. And I bought the Jeffrey Goldberg's uh, reasoning for this. You, all these journalists are being killed now in, in the Middle East. And it almost seems as if they're being targeted. Well, in a sense, they are. Not that the uh, ISIS wants to necessarily wants to capture journalists, but they are the Westerners and the Americans um, who can be snatched because they're in these dangerous places. And um, if you're French, uh, your government will pay for you to uh, get out, if, and Italians too. So uh, they often want to catch Italians or French or Europeans for the millions of dollars they'll get in ransoms. But our government and the British, and I think this is absolutely right, uh, do not pay ransoms. So all we're good for is beheading on camera. And it used to be, we felt, and I think it was true, that journalists, uh, the other side always wanted to tell its story. So we could go to a, a uh, uh, Islamic extremist and saying, look, uh, I'll, I'll tell your story. I mean, and they would say, well, right, here's how my chance to explain our movement mm -hmm. to the world. Mm -hmm. But, and Jeffrey Goldberg pointed this out in The Atlantic. Now they don't need that anymore. It's all on social media. Right. And they can get on their computers and get their message across. So when you... They don't need you They anymore. don't need us. So there's no immunity anymore. That kind of immunity that we were the... the impartial tellers of truth is gone, and they don't care about that at all. So there's no, there's no protective armor of being useful uh, to terrorists or another army or anything else. So it's interesting, you, you brought up the Middle East, and just in thinking about your life and your career, mm -hmm. and knowing you as a friend, reading your book, the crucible of Vietnam and the crucible of Iraq and the Middle East seem to be major focal points in your career. And I just wanted to maybe ask you to summarize your thoughts on Vietnam. When I think of you in Vietnam, I think of your long service there, the risks you took. You tried to help that young soldier. You were awarded a bronze star for that from the United States military. You entered the war as a correspondent thinking it was the right thing. You exit the war. You're there in the very last month of the war. 
Uh, so, so give us yeah. your sum up, your takeaways from that war. How do you look at it now? Well, the extraordinary thing that happened, uh, which surprised everybody, because it was the complete collapse of the South Vietnamese army. And um, in 1972, uh, the North Vietnamese had had an offensive across the border. And the um, South Vietnamese had been able to hold them. Now, they had American air power and, and uh, that, and, and, and uh, even naval gunfire. I was at the, the Michan Line in 72 when all of the north of, of South Vietnamese was, uh, South Vietnam was open to this invading army except for this thin line of, of South Vietnamese r Marine on the Michan River. And there was one American advisor, uh, no ground troops anymore. And he said quietly into the radio, lend me your assets. And all of a sudden, B-52s came in from Guam, and the ground was blowing up. Naval gunfire was firing in from the sea, airplanes coming in from Thailand. But the South Vietnamese Marines held. And the, once that was gone, in, in 75, after uh, Henry Kissinger thought he'd had a good agreement, um, that force that we trained had much more firepower than the North Vietnamese, much more equipment, uh, but it completely collapsed. They just took off their clothes and ran away. And um, it, it was an astonishing factor. In fact, um, towns were falling so fast that the South Vietnamese army was leaving before the North Vietnamese could even get there. Mm -hmm. So the South Vietnamese command would say, Nha Trang has fallen. Uh, but it would take three days for the... So everyone looks at this as a lightning advance of the North Vietnamese. It was, but the South Vietnamese were retreating faster right. than the advance <laughs> could come. Right. So we had a market theory of, a market theory of, of reporting because the, you couldn't believe what the South Vietnamese command was saying. So if you went to the market and the shrimps were still coming and the tr shrimps were all coming from Nha Trang, and we could talk to the truck drivers and they'd say, no, no, there are no North Vietnamese in Nha Trang. And, and if, if the lettuce was still coming, you knew that uh, Dalak hadn't fallen. So you could, you could tell by the vegetables and the products in the market, which part of the country was still. And so this complete collapse um, surprised everybody. And then, of course, last summer, we saw exactly the same thing. In Mosul. In Mosul. Here's this American-trained army. We'd spent billions on training, mm -hmm. equipping. And they took off their clothes and ran away. And the other side now is using their weapons. And there's a parallel there. Mm -hmm. And everyone's forgotten that the guy who, who was in charge of training in Baghdad, training the Iraqi army, was uh, General Dempsey, now the chief of staff. And nobody's asked him, well, you know, this was your army, General. You were responsible for training them. But he, he and his staff told me then, he said, you know, teaching a man to fight is not so hard. Uh, that's the easy part. Much harder is teaching them logistics, how to get the food up to the fighting front line and how to get, how to get uh, medicine and ammunition and all the logistics part of supplying an army. That's much harder. But impossible is motivation. So if these different ministries, uh, the armies and then the interior ministry for the police, and if they break down on sectarian lines, and this corruption, and then no matter what we do for training, we can't motivate. Right. So um, in Afghanistan, I went to see the um, General Caldwell, who was responsible for training the Afghan army, and his deputy was a Englishman named Dickie Winchester, Colonel Dickie Winchester. <laughs> 
and he had on the wall in his office a famous painting of up to that time in 1842, the worst defeat of the British Army when the, an entire army was cut to pieces, uh, retreating in winter from Kabul back to India, and uh, only one man survived. And there's a famous painting called The Last Stand of the 44th Regiment of Foot with the British soldiers standing with their bayonets and Afghans swarming over them. And I said, there's a memento mori on your wall, Colonel. And he said, you know, yes, but you know why that happened? We didn't pay off the tribes. And that was true. They had stopped their support of the tribes in the passes south of Kabul and they there were more reasons, but he, what he was getting to the point was that, that it was vital in, in uh, Afghanistan uh, to keep the support going. And um, who can say if we'd kept the support going in? We didn't have to have soldiers there, mm -hmm. but if we'd kept the support in South Vietnam, I don't think in the end we could have won in, in Vietnam uh, for all the reasons I described. The, momentum of nationalism and anti-colonialism was on the other side. But, but uh, the, the jury is still out what's going to happen in Afghanistan. But again, corruption is, is industrial strength. Uh, the money is pouring out to Dubai. American taxpayers' money is going out in suitcases. And um, a photographer friend of mine told me of going with a Afghan, American trained unit, but an Afghan unit. And they'd go into a town and they'd loot the stores, just take everything. And the officers were taking things too. So he asked the officer, well, why do you do this? And he said, I had to pay a bribe to have my commission and this is how I get my money back. Hmm. And, um, so it's, it's, again, you can train soldiers, a foreigner, Americans or anybody else. We can train foreigners, foreign army, but we can't motivate them. So one last question of Vietnam. Um, Rory Kennedy has produced, by all accounts, a brilliant film on the fall of Saigon. Yes, I've seen it. April like 1975. It. What do you think? And I think Tom's going to show it here at the library mm. in the spring. What do you think of it? What lessons thought, does it I thought it was a us? brilliant film. Um, I, I don't think the the... It, it wasn't a, a preachy film, as, as my book is. Uh, it doesn't try to make a political point. Uh, but it is so dramatic of the film that she managed to find uh, that people, even home movies people had taken, of helicopters arriving and their families being saved, and uh, that it's, it's very vivid uh, film. And you were in Saigon yes. for those events. Yes, The embassy yes. roof, the helicopter. Oh, not the thing. roof. I left from the courtyard. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but that's important because if you wanted to stay till the very end, you left from the roof. Mm -hmm. I felt that we needed to be able to file our stories. And if we got out to, you couldn't file in Saigon anymore. And uh, it isn't like today. You didn't have computers. So you needed somebody to transmit the story. Right. And so I left at dusk, um, and um, the whole city was in an unbelievable panic, and people trying to get climb over the gates of the embassy, and the Marines hitting them and throwing them back, and um, the, the, the city just in a in a in a paralyzing panic, and the helicopter rose up over the city, you could see the people swarming to try to get into boats on the Saigon River and the, and the ammunition dumps blowing up to the north and this whole American enterprise of 25, 30 years collapsing. And then the fleet out in the sea and these little boats that had escaped floating around and uh, they didn't throw our helicopter over the side but a lot of helicopters that would come in from South Vietnamese Air Force and Army units, they'd disgorge their passengers and then throw the helicopter into the sea. And the, in Rory's film, that's very vivid. You see them throwing the uh, 
these million dollar aircraft just throwing them into the sea because there wasn't room for them. So I want to link those events mm -hmm. uh, that are captured vividly in the book with the wars post 9-11. After 9-11, we came out swinging. Mm -hmm. We invaded Afghanistan, took down the Taliban government, occupied the country, we're still there 13 years later. Went into Iraq a year and a half later, occupied Iraq for eight years, left. Now we're back for our third Iraq war in 23 years, if you think of it, going all the way back to Desert Storm. Tell us how you view those wars in light of your Vietnam experience and the lessons that Americans might have learned. Well, again, we're uh, barging into other people's empires. We're going in where the where the French had failed in Vietnam, where the British had failed in Iraq, ultimately, and where both the British and the Russians had failed in, in Afghanistan. And um, uh, I can see why we needed to uh, go into uh, Afghanistan after 9-11. But where we went wrong was not getting out again. And that's why I think George Herbert Walker Bush's expulsion of the Iraqis from Kuwait was the right way to do it. And you, you get the job done, and then you leave. And he writes in his memoirs that if we had stayed in Iraq and overthrown Saddam Hussein, we would have been stuck with 40 million unhappy Arabs, and, and, and we might still be there. And his son didn't pay attention to the father, and we're still there. But I think the, the mistake is another thing that I don't mean to equate us with European colonialism, but there are some mirror images. Um, all empires like to at least dress up their desires to impose their will on another country by a missionary zeal. Uh, the Portuguese and the French wanted to bring uh, religion, uh, bring Christianity to these benighted savages. Uh, the French had their civilisatrice, their mission of bringing French culture and and the British had their laws and railways, and, and all of which did a lot of good. And we have democracy. And we had democracy. And this idea that we should implant democracy. Now, I'm all for democracy, but I think it's got to be done by example. And you can't really do it at the point of a bayonet. And I was so interested that in Kissinger's new book. World uh, Order. World Order, that he. Um, he was for the Iraq war. And I, I wrote this down because I thought it was so important. Um, he, uh, at the end of his book, says that it was a, a, a noble enterprise. I don't think it was a noble enterprise, but anyway. But to seek to achieve American values by military occupation in a part of the world where they have no historical roots and to expect fundamental change in a politically relevant period of time proved beyond what the American would support and what the Iraqi society could accommodate. And it was that missionary zeal. If you could see people in the green zone in 2005, uh, here are these idealistic Americans who wanted to bring a flat tax to Iraq they didn't know anything or care anything about Iraqi history and culture, but they thought we, American exceptionalism means we can oppose the American way of life, and they're gonna like it, and, um, it's, and they're gonna transform the Middle East. So that whole neoconservative idea that if we can turn Iraq into a functioning Western-style democracy, it'll spread through culture and bring all the Middle East around to our side, I think was mistaken from the start. And I had a very interesting talk with the Russian ambassador to Afghanistan. And as a young man, he'd been there during the Russian occupation. Now he was ambassador to, to our Iraq. Afghanistan. And, 
Yeah? Yeah. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I meant to say ambassador to our Afghanistan. And he said, you know, you're making the same mistake we did. And I said, discuss. <laughs> and um, he said, um, well, first of all, you know, we really believed we were coming here to help the Afghans. And we thought we were saving them from Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, the same way you are, or think you are. And um, we really believed that in his natural state, given his choice, an Afghan would want to be a communist. Why not? Just the way you think, if an Afghan really had his choice, he'd want to be an American. And you think that little purple ink on people's fingers uh, voting is going to wipe away a thousand years of ethnic and tribal conflicts, the same mistake we made. And I was fascinated by this. And uh, I thought the lesson was, um, go a little easy trying to, in your uh, civilisatrice. Uh, don't think you have to change uh, the culture of the country you're invading. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because, and this leads us, I think, mm -hmm. to the most important question in American foreign policy today, based on our Vietnam experience, on our Iraq-Afghan mm -hmm. experience. Uh, we know we're still the most powerful country mm -hmm. in the world. This is a question to you. Um, we know that we can intervene in other people's affairs sometimes and do necessary and good things when we stop the Bosnian War in 1995 when we stopped the ethnic cleansing of the coast of our Albanians by Milosevic in 1999. President Clinton's interventions, highly successful, and we've kept the peace there. But we've gotten into real trouble in other places, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. So what lessons do we learn from that? Well, what's the, what is the difference between What do those? you learn from that? Well, we didn't, we're not in Sarajevo today with a green zone size right. embassy trying to turn Bosnians into Americans. Uh, we didn't have this uh, missionary zeal in the conflicts you mentioned, mm -hmm. as George Herbert Walker Bush did not have a missionary zeal. So I think that missionary zeal has gotten in an awful lot of trouble. And um, when you try to uh, f become the imperial power and make the country anew into your image, that's when we go wrong. So you're not against American intervention no, in the world. No. You're against occupation and trying yes. to remake other countries. And also the militarization of American foreign policy. We, we, we put too much effort on, on force and military and not enough on diplomacy and, and soft power and a little of this and a little of that and economics and, 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 and just military solutions. And they've not, it's lessened American power. These adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan have lessened American power. They, they, they have shown that we can't be effective. They've emboldened our enemies. Uh, and I think you, the lesson of Vietnam is that you, you, the American people are not going to stand for these long wars, number one. And number two, be a little less ambitious about what you're trying to do. Okay, so based on what you said, two quick questions. President Obama has to make big decisions in the next several months on two issues, Afghanistan and Iraq. Let's take them in order. Uh, the president has said that our combat phase will be over very soon. He said that the other day. In Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. Yep. Uh, he said that all American troops will be out by two th 2016, the end of his mm. term in office. If that happens, if he takes all the troops out, I believe the Taliban will overwhelm the Afghan government, particularly in the southern part of the country, in Kandahar, Helmand, and mm. Oruzgan provinces, maybe take over the whole, whole country. Isn't there an argument to be made that we, sometimes we need to be constant, leave some forces to train the Afghan army? Yes, but how did we get to this point where that's the decision he's going to make? I think, you know, when you look at it, all we did was, uh, uh, at both Iraq and Afghanistan, we uh, took out the tribe or the Sunni, the sect, uh, 
uh, who had been in power for a thousand years and replace them with another group. Mm -hmm. uh, now we did that very carelessly. We d destroyed the Iraqi government without giving it enough thought and couldn't put it back together again. And that's what's wrong now. Uh, and in Afghanistan, when you think about it, all we did uh, was the, uh, to take the Northern Alliance, which was, and put them in power in Kabul and create a Southern Alliance, if you will, of Pashtuns who had ruled for a thousand years and felt they were, and quite, I They've think they excluded. were right. They, they had a part in it. Yeah. Now, I don't agree with you that the Taliban's gonna take over completely because there's enough um, power of the other minorities, Tajiks and Uzbeks. And uh, when the Taliban took over, Afghanistan was on its knees. It had just been so many wars that people, were, people accepted them and wanted order. We welcomed it. Our State Department mm -hmm. thought the Taliban coming in would be a good thing to restore order. Do you remember in that first day? I disagree. All right. 1995, six. I remember the time. All right. I disagree. But that's another conversation. But uh, uh, the, 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 the great thing in Afghanistan is the urban population has always been modern and freer with women's rights and education and all of this. Countryside's deeply conservative. Um, and every reformer for 100 years who tried to... Uh, use the urban group to bring reforms. It's always been overthrown by the countryside, uh, Taliban being the last of this. Uh, but now, um, this, because of so many wars, the balance between just the number of people in the cities and the countryside has shifted. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the Taliban can take uh, Kabul. Uh, but, uh, and you remember the, the um, Najibullah, mm -hmm. the, the communist stooge, after mm -hmm. the Russians left, Najibullah was their guy. To, he kept um, the major cities and the lines of communications open for three years. And it only ended when the Soviet Union stopped putting money in. And then he was executed. And then he was executed. Yeah. But in other words, when the Russians stopped to paying off the tribes, everything collapsed. and. Uh, and uh, the Russian ambassador said, and our guy lasted twice as long as your guy in Saigon. <laughs> but the point being, it, it, I think you're right. I think that now, given what we've done and been there so long, I think it would be a disaster to take out uh, everybody, all the American troops. I think- Which is that, the current plan. I know, but I don't think that's right. I don't think you should announce when you're gonna leave. And I think that uh, Ash Ashraf Ghani, I've talked to him, the new president, and he believes that they should stay too, and he's now going to have a status of forces agreement. And it won't be a huge force, but it will be a stabilizing factor, and we have to keep the money flowing there to pay off the tribes. Right. And David, in Iraq, yeah. does President Obama have any, any other option but to try to contain ISIS through air power? But how do we win a combined war in a Syria-Iraq combined battle space? Has there ever been a war of such contradictions? Right. You know, here right. we are uh, bombing ISIS and the big gainer is Assad. And yet we say Assad must go. So it is, it's an impossible mess. Conducting operations against ISIS as Iran conducts operations yes. against ISIS uh, last week. I think our pilots are going to be saluting each other as their planes cross our bombing <laughs> missions. I mean, it's extraordinary. But uh, I think it would be, a, what, what I'm afraid is that it will be like Vietnam in the sense that the, um, the advisors started just a few thousand which is and, where we are now, yeah, three and, or 4,000 American forces and, in Iraq. And then they ju the Obama just announced we was gonna put some more advisors in. Mm -hmm. And then that pushes a little bit further. It's called mission creep. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mission, well, we've put so much into this, we can't let that go. Uh, we have to defend our own forces, so therefore we have to send more people to s defend the soldiers we've already got there. And I could see this creeping up, and I think this would be a terrible mistake. 
I think one of the reasons of these beheadings of Americans was to drag us in. I think ISIS wanted to provoke us because so they could say, we are the anti-colonials. We are defending the sacred soil from Americans. And, and have you noticed how this anti-colonial pitch ISIS is using it so successfully? There was that article in the Times about the journalists in, uh, sorry, some students in Tunisia who said what he really liked about ISIS is that they were erasing the Sykes-Picot agreement, the mm -hmm. agreement after World War I between the French and the British, dividing up the Middle East, Syria for France, Iraq for Britain. He loved the idea that ISIS was erasing this. So the pull of anti-colonialism is still there. Right. And I think they wanted to drag us in so they could be defenders of the faith. They're not gonna, ISIS is too hot. Uh, it kills too many people, it's too brutal. The, I don't believe the Arabs will permit this. The Sunni the, Arabs. The Sunni Arabs in the yeah. long run will permit this. But the one chance ISIS has, we're standing up to the United States. Any patriotic Iraqi has to join us, or Syrian, or any Sunni has to join us. They would, they're dying to make us the focal point. And then it will cow the opposition and they'll be defending uh, their Muslim lands against us. I think that's exactly what they want. Okay. I hope we don't fall for it. So we can come back to Iraq. I'm going to, um, we have two microphones here, and people are welcome to line up at these microphones. We can talk about Iraq. I have one more question as you think about your questions for David, and then we'll go to the mics. Um, you've been all over the world. You've covered every major crisis. You had an opportunity to meet and interview and spend time with presidents, prime ministers, ambassadors, generals. Who impressed you? Who were the singular figures that really stand out in a half century's reporting? Very kindly, Nick ticked me off earlier today that I, <laughs> so I'd have some time to think of the answer. Uh, and it's I, a friendly I, interview. Uh, I decided <laughs> that uh, of the people that I've talked to, um, would be Nelson Mandela and Sadat and Yitzhak Rabin. And of the three, the one I got to talk to the longest was Rabin. Um, so I know his feeling better. But what was impressive about them, and they, they, the three of them were very impressive individuals. Uh, they just exuded leadership. And, um, but they were willing to change their position in the interests of their country and, 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 and be able to put old wars aside. And they and, risked their lives, each of them. And, and two of them paid the price, yeah. killed by their own side. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, fanatics on their own side. But Mandela, after everyone knows the story, after 20 years in prison, he was able to say, uh, well, we, 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 we're not going to go after revenge. We're going to have a healing society. And Sadat um, had the boldness to use a war to create peace. He attacked in the Sinai. The October War, 73. Yes, yeah. and in order to show his country that uh, the honor of Egypt could be restored, and then he was able to go to Jerusalem and make peace with Israel in the interest of his country. Right. Rabin, who had ordered that Arab boys' hands be broken so they couldn't throw stones in the first intifada, saw the light, said, here's the chance. We can really build on this Oslo thing, and we can have a two-state solution and he put his prestige and his leadership behind it. And I think, I, I'll believe to the last of my life, if he'd lived, he could have pulled it off. But that assassin's bullet uh, changed the Middle East. 
And you see the ramifications of something like this. Sadat was, uh, excuse me, Rabin was close to an Israeli-Syrian deal. I was working for yes. Secretary of State Christopher. We were shuttling yeah. back and forth between Damascus and yeah. Jerusalem in those days. And he was close to a deal mm -hmm. with the Palestinians. The whole map of the Middle East exactly. might have been different had it been for that one yes. assassin against Rabin. Yeah, and it shows how a leader, the right leader at the right time, can make a difference. And you take him off the chessboard and... Right. This is a fascinating book. Lots that we can learn about our present situation here in the United States from a great Bostonian. Go right to your question Hi, first. Hi, my name is Ellen. I'm from the Cape, and I have to say, this is so wonderful, really. And it's nice to meet a, a, a Yaley because I went to Connecticut College. But, <laughs> um, you know, listening to all this, it's so upsetting. I can't begin to tell you. I feel like there's just no leader out there. And I'm wondering, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm wondering if you can tell me who you think is really a good leader today, and I'm very concerned also about Israel um, and what you think of Netanyahu. I'm not a big fan of Netanyahu. I, I knew him when he was here in the United States. I used to see him all the time. Um, and I remember, right, I, just by coincidence, I was in uh, Jerusalem when the Oslo news broke. And I saw Rabin and Netanyahu um, um, one right after the other. And Rabin was so elated. He said, here's the chance. I can grab this chance now. This is the beginning of the peace Yeah, the Oslo Peace Accords. 93. He could build on that. And he said, I'm not going to let the settler movement um, defeat me on this. And I thought that he alone had the... Uh, military background and the and the presence to be able to uh, convince the hardliners in Israel that well maybe we're nervous about this but we can trust this guy. Netanyahu was completely negative about it. He said no, this is absolutely the wrong way to go. We can't have any of this. We need to stop this dead. I just thought the difference between the two people was so remarkable. And the complimentary question: Is there a world leader out there? Do you see who is doing his or her job well, leading, making tough choices? Well, I'm afraid the world leader who's impressing his people is, is Putin, but I think it's the wrong road. Mm. I was going to say Angela Merkel might be the singular most effective world leader well, of a major country today. Maybe you're right. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't given that enough thought. You didn't tip me off on I that I didn't question. tip you off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm chairman of the think tank, the Center for Security and Social Progress. My question deals with France's influence in Vietnam. Excuse me, with? France, French influence in Vietnam. Yes. In Vietnam. Following the French defeat in Indochina, what happened to those Vietnamese who, who were pro-French, pro-West, uh, who spoke French, maybe had a French education, sometimes were Christian, uh, were they imprisoned, sent to a gulag, killed or exiled or left alone? In fact, I knew one, one of them. He was Monsieur Portiche. He was the French consul general in Boston. And he was half French, half in, uh, Vietnamese. Well, as you remember, the, the, uh, in 1954, the agreement was that um, when South Vietnamese, Vietnam became its own country, and North Vietnamese became its own country after the French War. There was agreement that those who wanted to stay in the switch sides could do so. And an enormous Catholic population, because Catholicism was very successful in Vietnam. And um, maybe a million Catholics came south and were resettled in the south. And you remember, uh, No Dinh Diem uh, was Catholic. Um, fewer people went north, but some, some did. True communist believers went north. What happened to them afterwards? I don't think there was a big retaliation against people who spoke French or were Catholic or had embraced French civilization. I think it was much more um, on uh, a class thing that rich people, those who had worked for the South Vietnamese government uh, 
they needed to be re-educated. And they suffered terribly in these re-education camps. And that's why uh, we tried to get, and didn't get enough out, we tried to get as many Vietnamese out who had worked for our side. Uh, but yeah, a lot of them who stayed uh, suffered a lot. And also I think the French, when I think France more than any other country imparted on its colonies that to be a civilized person you have to speak French. The, 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 the language is, is very important. And when I first went there, um, I was sneered at because my French was so bad. Uh, <laughs> but I think now, as in elsewhere, the English is becoming so much the lingua franca uh, all over the world that I think French culture has suffered a little bit. So I accompanied Secretary of State Warren Christopher to Hanoi when we reestablished diplomatic relations mm. with the Vietnamese after 40 years. And we had a, the foreign minister gave a big lunch for Secretary Christopher. It was fascinating to see that the oldest Vietnamese diplomats spoke French mm. as their first foreign language. The middle-aged guys and gals spoke Russian. And the young 20-somethings were speaking English. Mm -hmm. And they all wanted to learn English. This is 1995. And you know, Vietnam is now asking the Obama administration to come back to Vietnam with our naval forces to protect it from the Chinese. So things come full circle in life. Um, there's a great story, it's a very sad story actually, in your book about a French planter that you met. Yes. While you were, you yes. might tell that story. He was a rubber planter up near the Cambodian border. There was a big French company called Terre Rouge and they were rubber growers. And I went to visit him uh, on his plantation. And then when I went back again, the plantation had been destroyed. Uh, he'd been killed, the house had been knocked down, and uh, the South Vietnamese were uh, stealing some francs that they had found in the ruins. And this one uh, American, I think he was Special Forces, uh, calmed them out of giving him I don't know me how thousands of francs, but he said, you, I'll give you um, five American cents on every hundred franc note you bring me or something. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he made a fortune. But uh, you know, those French planters um, had a deal with the Viet Cong and the Viet Cong wouldn't attack their plantations um, because it employed workers and, and uh, brought money and the French uh, planters would pay a certain amount to the Viet Cong. And so they had their kind of a, a neutral position uh, you know, up on the rubber plantations. Merci. First of all, a thank you to you both, uh, Mr. Greenway, for your book, of course, but your writing. It's always wonderful to open the paper and see your column there. And, and Ambassador Burns, you as well. So thank you both, and please keep writing. Um, Mr. Greenway, you mentioned the militarization of our policy, which has been going on for really decades. I mean, just before John Kennedy took office, Eisenhower warned us against the military industrial complex, and here we are 50 plus years later. And I wonder to what extent that has really driven our policies, both in Vietnam, uh, both from a military standpoint, but also the economic interests that were served by that. Uh, and then I also have a question along the economic lines about our, our experience in Iraq uh, pertaining to oil. We now have ma the major oil companies are all there. And I wonder how much of that, so both the military side and the economic motivations behind both of those two areas where your book uh, addresses. Well, I, I don't, I hope, I, I'd like to ask Nick that question too, uh, what your view would be, but I don't think we went into Iraq or Vietnam uh, for economic reasons. Um, in that, we were, that classic colonialism for economic reasons wasn't the motivation. I think we really thought we are saving the world from communism and we have to make this stand. And we, we, we didn't see that it really wasn't about communism as I've tried to explain. But how could we see that from our point of view? But I don't think oil was the reason we went into 
Baghdad either. Now, obviously, uh, sources of energy are very important, and I will. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any quarrel with protecting sources of energy. I, I think oil is a legitimate reason uh, to be interested in a country. But I don't think it was the over preening issue. I thought the think that the neoconservative had a plan, and when 9-11 came, President Bush, there was a plan, so he took it. And they had people like uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl, and they had this dream of uh, we can use American force, American power, military power, to promote democracy. Now that's where I think we went wrong. And it isn't just Republicans. Remember Madeleine Albright telling Colin Powell, why do we have this great big wonderful army if we can't use it? And I think the temptation of this idea, uh, the freedom agenda, I think, isn't that what they call it in the Bush administration? That we would use military power to promote American values was the fundamental mistake. And I, what do you think, Nick? I agree with you on both counts, and I think that um, one of the, 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 the most difficult problem we have right now in Washington uh, is to figure out when do we intervene, when do we not intervene. When President Clinton did not intervene in Rwanda in April 1994, 800,000 people died in the genocide. We were four years late getting to Bosnia, so 250,000 people died, two and a half million homeless. So. One of the lessons I think that we learned, I served in the Clinton administration, is there is a principled use of American power and diplomacy to resolve war and to save people's lives. And I think the lesson of Bosnia and Rwanda is sometimes you need to go in uh, quicker with more resolve. But of course, no two situations are alike. And clearly, I think, if most people look at the film, Iraq, March 2003, could we roll it back to the finish and start again? We would. And I think for a lot of people, it wasn't really the intervention. It was the fact that we lost our way and ended up occupying a country we had not meant to occupy. We did not mean to occupy Iraq. We stayed for eight years. I think that's the larger problem. Well, this Nick and I might disagree on this a little. I'm a little suspicious of, of humanitarian intervention. Uh, I, you have to take each case as it comes. But I'm afraid that when you invade a country, you often create more problems than you have solved. And I think Iraq's a perfect example of that. Uh, so I, I'd maybe be a little less anxious to use military force for humanitarian reasons, because when you use military force, you're going into the China shop throwing baseball bats. You don't know where it's going to end. You don't know how much crockery is going to be broken on the floor even though you might mean well. This is a longer conversation. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Dave Whittemore from Marlboro. I'd like to ask both of you a question, but make a comment first. Uh, seems to me Washington is in defense mode. Defense Department, NASA, all this surveillance. We've got to catch these people before they blow us up. I would like to ask you, having served in the State Department and you being outside and seeing, I mean, we had friends who were in the State Department and there were always the butch haircuts, the people, who were the people there to do the survey work for the FBI maybe, who stood out from the regular ambassadorial group. Do you think it's possible for the State Department to become more relevant? You were there, and we get people coming in there who think like we do. And it seems to me, from what Dave said, we need some more street people who understand the people that we're trying to help. So, question. That's yours, Nick. Uh, <laughs> this is all about you today. Very quick answer. No. Um, I think, first of all, um, that President Obama, you refer to the Defense Department, has made a great choice in Ash Carter. I work with Ash in the US government, the Clinton administration. I work with him at Harvard. He actually is one of the reasons I came to Harvard in 2008. And I think we have a person there of great quality, substance, integrity, and competence. And the Defense Department is just about the most difficult department to manage. So I feel good about 
the president's decision. You've asked a really tough question. David referred to the fact that I think we have seen the militarization of our foreign policy, the over-reliance on the military. And as a former diplomat, and I teach diplomacy and negotiations at Harvard now, I think we've got to rely on our ability to persuade, intimidate, out-negotiate, out-fox, out-think our opponents and not just try to out-muscle them. Colin Powell used to say, the proper disposition of American assets in the world is diplomats on point, out in front, in the field, military and reserve. And we effectively have reversed that since 9-11. Problem occurs, you know, hit somebody, and then figure out what to do, and I think that's exactly the wrong order. I actually always believed as a diplomat it was helpful to have the 82nd Airborne standing behind me at a negotiation. You know, you want to negotiate with us, or you get the military. And we do need to integrate the military with diplomacy, but we need to rely more on our diplomats. We've got a great State Department, particularly our career foreign service, great men and women. We should rely on them more often. I, I couldn't agree more. I th don't they call it coercive diplomacy? Coercive you, diplomacy. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. <laughs> but let's not use the 82nd Airborne so much. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, Jeff Jacoby uh, in the Globe uh, today had an op-ed uh, in which uh, he stated that um, essentially boots on the ground are a great force for democracy. And he cited in particular uh, Germany, South Korea, and Japan as examples where that's worked. It seems to run in counterpoint to the position that uh, you've taken today. And I wondered what you might say to Mr. Jacoby were he in the audience uh, Maybe well, he is. I have great Maybe. respect for, for Jeff. I hired him. Uh, <laughs> but Was um, it a good choice? Are you happy you hired him? Yeah, we, we needed a conservative <laughs> voice on the page, and yeah. Jeff gave it to us. <laughs> but I think there's a huge difference here. And uh, I noticed in the green zone in Baghdad that this example of Germany and Japan was brought up again and again. Mm -hmm. Look what we did then. We transformed these two militaristic fascist states and brought them into democracy. And um, that's true. But they were the most homogeneous countries you could think of, Japan and Germany. Iraq, with its different tribes and Sunni and Shia, could not possibly be comp c compared to Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm both of which had been industrialized modern countries before we knocked down their factories. So really all we had to do was build their factories up again with the Marshall Plan and other assistance, and they were off and running. So we're, and boots on the ground in the Second World War was quite different than the kind of semi-colonial wars we've fought since, and you just can't compare neither Germany or Japan with the complicated medieval rivalries that you find in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's just a different uh, boots on the ground, but the ground is different in Iraq and Afghanistan. It, the boots may be the same, but the ground is completely different. So I, I don't think there's the inconsistency um, that you see, uh, because I think the situation after World War II was completely different. Thank you. Yes, sir. Paul Hedesi from Newton. Um, as, as a former army officer and military affairs reporter, I have a question that I think applies to both of you. And when, it, when I listen to the discussion of, of um, our foreign policy, the U.S. foreign policy and where it's going, the one word keeps on coming to me, um, naivete to a certain extent. That is, uh, as in The Ugly American, for example, that, that book, and then later Neil Sheehan's book about uh, Bright Shining Lie. Uh, it, it, we, we don't seem to understand, we, we go into these conflicts not understanding who our enemies are. You know, that, and, and I wonder whether both of you feel that way and whether it, finally it leads to the question of are we, there's another book, Are We Rome? Um, um, in other words, are, it, it, do we parallel the Rome experience of not understanding its enemies and spreading the legions and so on? I think you're onto something important, and I talked th about this a little bit in the book, but I think that um, we, well, McNamara, 
Robert McNamara, the, one of the great architects of the Vietnam War, admitted later that he'd been wrong, uh, that he hadn't, uh, if he'd understood the complexities of what he was getting into and the culture of Vietnam, um, one of the things that interested me is, according to the Pentagon Papers, we went into Vietnam to stop the expansion of China. But if you knew anything about Vietnamese history, they'd been occupied by China for a thousand years. All their heroes, their George Washingtons, their Thomas Jeffersons, had fought against the Chinese. And that the greatest bar against Chinese expansion in Southeast Asia might have been the North Vietnamese Army. We didn't see that. And we didn't see uh, that Ho Chi Minh might have been a Tito, a communist, but not pro-Russian or pro-Chinese. And I don't think that we could conceive, I, I hate to put it in these terms, but I don't think we thought that an Asian could be a Tito the way a European could. And that chance was lost. But I think you're absolutely right. And uh, in Afghanistan, as I mentioned, people seem to be more interested in, in um, flat taxes and they were the history of Afghanistan. And when, when General Petraeus got to Afghanistan, he admitted, we don't know enough about the tribes and the uh, ethnic mix in, in Afghanistan. So I think that again and again, now it wasn't that there weren't people to tell McNamara uh, about the culture of Vietnam, but he, he didn't want to listen. And I think this has been a problem that I've seen in all three uh, conflicts that somehow Americans tend to think, well, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter the complexity. We're Americans. And all of that doesn't matter anymore. So I think you're onto something. Thank you very much. What, did, Nick, have you got a point, a thought on that? I actually agree with you on oh, this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Full agreement. Okay. Full agreement. Not for a discussion later? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one. Yeah. Mr. Vasturo. Hey, Harmon from Wesson. I have two questions and I'll give you a choice. They're quick. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the, that the, we give the money to the tribes wherever they are and the money ends up in Dubai. Is there any way to make the money stick in the tribe and be more effective diplomatically and military? Number two, my wife and I took a great bicycle trip in Morocco. And there was an English language uh, editorial in the Arabic newspaper saying that the three great princes of peace in the Arabic world are King Abdullah of Jordan, King Hussein VI of, Mo of uh, Morocco, and of all people, Bashar Assad, the president of Syria. What happened to Bashar Assad that he became no longer the prince of peace? Thank you for that question. And just wanted to thank the former vice principal of Wellesley High School for being here today. <laughs> well, what happened, Nick? Uh, uh, why? Uh, I, I, no one has ever explained to me sufficiently why overthrowing Assad was in the interest of the United States. Can you help me with that one? So the reporter's turning, turning the tables of this entire interview. He's returning to his roots. He's interviewing me. What do you think? <laughs> no, I asked you first. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, you know, and I'm someone who's been very, I admire President Obama. Mm -hmm. and I all, do too. But... And we all want him to succeed. But having said that, I think if you look back at his six years in office, he has consistently refused to make tough decisions on Syria. Either way, a tough decision mm -hmm. is we'll have nothing to do with it. He's half in and he's half out. And I think... When you say, as the President of the United States, as the strongest leader in the world, Assad must go, that's a declaratory policy. Mm. And then not to back it up makes us look weak. When you draw a line in the sand, as the President did twice in 2012, and say to Assad publicly, if you cross that line, I'm going to hit you. And Assad crossed the line, we didn't hit him. I heard in my trips in Asia, Latin mm. America, and Europe, what has happened? to American foreign policy, when you say something, you have to back it up. And I think that's the problem the president well, has. Well, I'd agree that red lines, it's a mistake to make red lines, because it may be advisable not to pursue that. And I would argue, in the end, what's more important, an ineffectual air raid against Assad, and it would have been just a punitive raid. We weren't planning 
carpet bombing or anything that would change the air strikes against his air force, which yeah, would have been effective maybe in denying them the capacity to hit civilians. Well, was it really going to be that big a bombing campaign? You remember, we'll, we'll Kerry know. said, you can't imagine how small this is going to be. You remember? I do remember that. But yes, which, which was more important, to get the chemical weapons out or do a, a, a raid just to prove something? I'd say the, getting the chemical weapons out was more important than punishing Assad. In fact, that was punishing Assad, getting him to give up his chemical weapons. I, 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 I've never understood why that counted so much against him. But of course so you're, you're right, he made the red line. If he hadn't done that, if he'd kept his options open and said, now I tell you what I'm gonna do. Assad, you have uh, uh, crossed this red line, I'm now gonna make you take all your weapons out. Wouldn't that have, you would never have had that problem of, yeah. of, of, of how it appeared. The president has two big problems right now in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're now involved in our third war in 23 years in yes. Syria and in Iraq. We cannot be successful in containing ISIS in northern Iraq, in western and northern mm -hmm. Iraq, if we don't hit their bases uh, in Syria itself. Mm -hmm. And yet we're not willing to arm moderate rebels to the extent that they can be effective in undermining ISIS there. The second problem is half the population of Iraq is homeless. I wrote an op-ed in the Globe on Thursday. Half the population mm. of the country is homeless. There's no other country in the world with that mm. catastrophic a problem. And a lot of people are calling for no-flight zones and ex creation of humanitarian exclusion zones inside Syria to save the women and children of Syria from destruction. The only country that can do that is the United States. So the president's got big decisions to make. Mm in the next couple of And months. as you pointed out in that column, there's never been a humanitarian crisis to this, this size. Right, right. So, and at some point when, yeah. when the humanitarian crisis just explodes, mm -hmm. Srebrenica, July 1995, mm -hmm. the United States has to act mm -hmm. in some capacity and the president is very hesitant to act. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Well, as you know, uh, well, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I agree with you. Um, and I think his, as I said, the big mistake was to make these red lines. I think that's always a mistake because circumstances may so change. So leave your options open. Leave the options over. Don't make red lines. Don't say you're going to, if you do this, you can let your adversary know that without making a public statement. I'm sure you've done that plenty when you were a diplomat. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We have time for one final question. We have one person standing, so it's perfection. Ed McDonough, Norwood Mass. Um, news bureaus were once heavily invested in by news organizations. They have been dismantled. Uh, they no longer have local people with local connections. At the same time, uh, citizen journalists with social media have came about. Do they compensate for one another, or is there a serious loss not having uh, those network of news bureaus? I say this is a serious loss. Uh, because the citizen journalists aren't trained properly, the news organizations can't really know where that film's, who's taking that film. Someone has, a, and lots, they found out lots of film has been manufactured, faked. So the networks no longer know whom they're buying for the film from. It's not their own cameraman anymore. And um, I think this, I'm hopeful that this will improve and change, but I do think the uh, decline of, of, of uh, old-fashioned uh, trained journalists in, in bureaus supported by their organizations, uh, no, maybe not the expense accounts that I enjoyed, but, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I think that's a, a serious loss. And can I just thank you for your question. Can we end on this, and can I ask you one final question? Mm. So aren't we now in the position, we're the strongest country in the world, we have a huge amount at stake in the rest of the world, our population needs to be informed, but if you turn on MSNBC, you're getting a left-wing view of the world. If you turn on Fox, you're getting a right-wing view of the mm. world. We could read your columns in the 60s and 70s, and all of your colleagues' columns, and count on objectivity of a sort. Mm -hmm. Have we lost that? Yeah, I think we have. Uh, and I think it's a shame. And, but now, as the uh, 
America used to be united by, um, well, there were only three networks. Right. Uh, JB and I once took one of those Zephyr trains from Denver to San Francisco, and we were up in the dome, and we said, oh, this must be a, a, a hometown group that's taking a big trip together, because they're all talking about Johnny's operation. And then it dawned on us they were talking about Johnny Carson. And uh, the... And yeah. if, if Walter Cronkite was the most trusted American, there are no Walter Cronkites anymore. There are no uh, agreed upon centers of information that people can trust. Now, the internet is bringing up a vaster range of information, but it, it doesn't yet have the authority. Uh, and too often, the blogger, as Ward just famously said, the blogger can be the drunk at the end of the bar. <laughs> so you so, don't know. It, 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 the, 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 it's a kaleidoscope now. The news business is a kaleidoscope. It'll settle into an image. But right now, it's so fractured that, that, that it hasn't gotten a co the cohesion has been lost. So in addition to the Boston Globe, where do we go for enlightened, objective journalism? <laughs> <laughs> Read Nick's column. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> You're too good. <laughs> so, so before we leave, I want to thank Amy McDonald, Tom Putnam, of this fabulous John F. Kennedy Memorial Library. And I want to encourage you all, look at this book. We got a lot to learn from it. Please join me in thanking David Greenway. <laughs> Wonderful. That's good. <laughs> Let's have a hand for Nick, the best press agent, press agent I ever had. <laughs>